Welcome to the Church on the Hill Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from our Sunday morning service. If you have any questions about the message or about the church, or would like to know more about who we are, please feel free to contact our church office through the contact information located here on the website. So if you have your Bible, I want you to go there, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on a subject just called Created with Purpose. Created with Purpose. But before, you, before I read that, I, I, just was, I, I was just thinking about it. And in a conversation with one of, our, one of our men yesterday morning over breakfast, I started thinking about a passage of Scripture that I didn't really bring into this message um, but I want to read it before we start. It's not going to be the, cha- the, the passage from Ephesians, but I just want you to listen to me. It's not going to be on the screen, so you're actually going to have to listen. And so uh, um, uh, hopefully, hopefully you're okay um, temperature-wise. It's really difficult to try to decide to make it colder or warmer. One person told me this morning, if you see me fall asleep, it's because you usually fall asleep right before you freeze to death. <laughs> And I said, oh, brother. And then he said, if I take my coat off, you know I'm too warm. I said, okay, you'll be my thermometer there. So um, he's not sleeping and his coat's still on, so I'm going to trust the rest of you are okay. Um, But I want to read this to you because Jeremiah goes down. Chapter 18, Jeremiah, this is what he says. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. When I went down to the potter's house, there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good for the potter to make. So now if you have your Bible, go to, or your phone or your iPad or whatever, go to Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to read this. And I wanted to read that passage because it really speaks to the theme of this message that I'm going to talk to you about this morning. And that is being recreated in the image of God and that that God created you with a purpose and that you're not here by accident, but you're here by sovereign design and, and, uh, and that God really does have a plan and a purpose for you and for your life. And so uh, let's read together chapter two, book of Ephesians. I'll be reading from the New King James verses one through 10. Paul writes and says, and you, he, Jesus, made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath just as others." But God, everybody say, but God. But God, God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. I want to ask you a favor. Would you read verse 10 with me again one more time? Ready, go. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now we've done it a lot, but can we do it again? Can we just open our hands and pray? Father, thank you for the word. This is your word, God. This is actually Jesus revealed to us in letter. And Father, we recognize that this is not just a book, but it is the living word of God spoken to us. And so now, Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to receive and then give us a will to obey, Father, to recognize that which you've called in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. So um, how many in the room have ever built anything or built a house? Anybody ever been involved in building a house? Raise your hand if you've ever built a house. How many of you ever, anybody, any architects in the room? Okay, so uh, how many uh, understand that before an architect 
before an architect can begin to draw a, a building, there's always, like this picture, a preliminary meeting in which the architect uh, has to meet with the clients and a number of questions must be answered. So what's the primary purpose of the building? What will it serve? Is it gonna be commercial or residential? How many people are gonna use it? Uh, will it be in its appearance utilitarian and very practical? Or, or do you wanna make an artistic statement about uh, your company or your personality or your family? Now, now for if you think about it, for important and obvious reasons, uh, that discussion is really important, and here's why. Because intended function determines form. So that's a, that's a blank on your little handout. Intended function determines form. You want to be sure that you design a building that's going to function the way you need it to function. And so the design of that building, the function it will serve is going to determine what type of structure you're going to build. And, and are, you going to, are, are you going to build in uh, certain attributes or certain features? It has to serve what it was designed for. So I I want you to think about this. If an architect, if men will take that much care and that much time for a temporal structure, how much more care do you imagine went into the creation of man and the design of your life by God? You see, contrary to popular opinion, and of the evolutionist opinion, men, you are not just a fluke of nature. You are not just the eventual byproduct of millenniums of evolution and natural selection. How many agree with that statement? Yeah. I've had some people in my family that certainly act like they came from the ape side of this thing, but you know, they're not, they're not. So let me show you a graphic so you'll know where I'm coming from for future conversation. If the theory of evolution were true, so where are millions of these? There are millions of these chimpanzees and there are millions of these homo sapiens, human beings. Where are the millions of these, the between species? Just a question for if you buy into evolution, just search it out. They're not around. You can't find them. And, and every one of the uh, news media's great finds, they find a skull, they find something, they try to prove, oh no, we've actually found the missing link. How many of you know they still haven't found the missing link? And they're not going to because God created man. Amen. God created man. And, and the other night, my wife and I were watching the, um, uh, the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra. It was a great show on, on, on um, public television, but it was the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra that was started back in the 1800s. It was fantastic. And there was a, they had a, an Asian pianist that was playing, and I mean, it was incredible. And as we sat there, my wife looked at me and she said, I never heard a chimpanzee do that. <laughs> I said, me either. <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen. Okay, so I'm just, I just want to say that, that, that I want you to understand if God, if, if man puts so much time in planning and building a structure, how much time and effort and intention do you think God put into the design and the plan of man? that he created us. So, so I, I want you to get this. We were created for something far greater than your sensual gratification. You were created for something far greater than the fulfillment of a selfish ambition. You were created for something far greater than just self-fulfillment. I want what I want and the world's all about me. You know, if those things were true, if that's what you were created for, if sex were the ultimate pinnacle of the existence of man, then wouldn't prostitutes be the happiest people on the face of the earth? I mean, that if, if, that if a high, getting high, like it was the ultimate expression of humanity and fulfillment, then wouldn't drug addicts be the most fulfilled and happy people on the planet? If just the attainment of personal wealth and, and being able to buy whatever you want, whenever you want, then wouldn't all the billionaires on the planet be the most fulfilled and happiest people you know? How many of you know it's not true, is it? Because you were designed with a specific purpose by God. Look at this. We were designed, fashioned, and brought to life by God's own creative hand. You were fashioned and designed by him. Why? To enjoy and partake of the blessings of this life and of this earth. That God's given us this earth to enjoy. 
How many of you know the earth is not evil? That God gave it to us to enjoy. Okay, so you were created by God, formed and created by his own hand to enjoy and partake of this earth. And just like the vessel that's to the left of that picture, you were to be created to be useful, to contribute and to give something back. That's why you were created, that God formed you and I. This speaks to the creation of man and our natural birth. So if, let me take a moment and let me talk to you about our conversion or what we call the new birth. Conversion or salvation is often treated as a decision that we make. Well, I, I chose the Lord. Well, I found the Lord. Uh, just uh, heads up, uh, FYI, the Lord wasn't lost. You were. Okay, so conversion. We make it sort of a passive acceptance of a creed or of a belief system. But in this second chapter of the book of Ephesians, Paul treats it so much differently. To Paul, the salvation experience is far more than just praying a prayer, going to church, we gain heaven, we miss hell. Paul is talking to us about a stunning spiritual conversion, something, a transformation, something happens that totally redirects the course and the future of your life. The transformation that must take place if you and I are truly to fulfill the purpose for which we were created. You were created, you were brought to life for the purpose of loving and glorifying God. You were given life for the purpose of being conformed to his image and to love and to serve other people. Let me just, let me give you scripture to validate what I'm saying. Here's what Jesus said. Uh, the, the guy, the lawyer asked him in Matthew 22, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And we really like to stop there. But he said, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you, that's where Christianity gets sticky, isn't it? It's loving those other people. Lord, I just wish you'd save them and take them to heaven. <laughs> what does that mean? You won't make it? I don't know. I, uh, you know, we, 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 it's that we, oh, I love you, Lord. I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But boy, those people. <laughs> Folks, listen. There's no shortage of resources and people and ministries uh, that are willing to give us good advice about how to get the most out of life. But it's often much simpler than we want to make it. And as we learn to do two things, as we learn to give and to serve other people, you will discover the very purpose for which you were designed. Look at this old Danish proverb. It gives it such clarity. Here it is. Here it is. You are, what you are is God's gift to you. What you do with yourself is your gift to God. What you are. God has made you who you are. And he doesn't make junk. He doesn't make junk. See, so turn to your neighbor and say, see, I told you so. That goes both ways, right? Either you thought they were or they thought you were. They're, God doesn't make junk, folks. Look at William Barclay. Let me read you a quote from William Barclay. There is only one kind of greatness, the greatness of service. The world is filled with people who are standing on their own dignity when they should be, kneel, they should be kneeling at the feet of their brethren. Whew. A lot of people, Proverbs says, every man will declare his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find, a faithful man. There's only one kind of greatness, the greatness of service. The world is filled with people who are standing on their own dignity, but when they should be kneeling at the feet of their brethren. Let me say this, you're not an accident. I was not an accident. You and I are not just a random species of mammal evolving our way through time, struggling to make sense of our existence. We were designed, we were shaped, fashioned into the very image of God and we were created with purpose. We are here with purpose. If you notice, if you believe the other side, if you believe that you are just a random product of natural selection and evolution, then there is no morality, there is no right, there is no wrong, there is no heaven, there is no hell, and then therefore you can just live like the animals and have you noticed that's what the world is doing. But you were created and called to a higher standard. You were created to be formed into the very image of God. You are not an accident. Turn to your neighbor and say, see, I told you so. 
You might be sitting by someone you don't know very well. That makes it awkward and even more fun. So just say, see, I told you so. You're not an accident. So how many recognize this lady? Look at this slide. How many recognize this lady? Who is she? Mona Lisa. Nat King Cole had a great song that most of you are too young to even know. Okay, but Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa. And I've actually seen her in the Louvre in Paris. And can I tell you, I was really disappointed because the whole painting is about this big. It's tiny. It's tiny, and they have it under glass, and they have it in this oxygen-free environment, and they only let you get about as close as I am to Sherry. You can't even get near the thing. And it was like, wow, I need, a, I need binoculars. And, and I was pretty unimpressed, you know, but she's pretty famous, isn't she? Well, she was, she is, rather, the masterpiece of this man, Leonardo da Vinci. And she remains today, after more than 500 years, as one of his most recognized work, works. But how many of you understand, she did not just evolve onto that canvas. <laughs> she didn't evolve onto that canvas. Uh, the artist, Leonardo, was incredibly intentional. In fact, sketched multitudes of uh, predecessors to that. And, and, and she didn't just evolve. She was a product of deliberate intent, deliberate intention. And, and, and creative work. If, if Leonardo was that meticulous, how much more purposeful do you believe that God our Father was when he formed Adam from the dust of the ground, when he breathed the breath of life into him? And how much more intentional do you think he was when you were fashioned and formed and knit within your mother's womb? That God designed you, that God planned you, and you might be saying, yeah, well, I didn't want buck teeth. It ain't fair. <laughs> how many of you know God designed you exactly how you are? And in his sight, you're created perfect in his image and you're beautiful. It's only, it's only the standards of men that start to put uh, benchmarks on beauty and what's acceptable and what's beautiful. And, and isn't it interesting how it's changed? Because it wasn't too long ago that, that women that were a little bit, how do I say this and not get in trouble? Women that were a little bit on the, on the healthier side were considered to be the, the epitome of what a woman looks like now if they look like a bean pole in a skirt. They were, that's the image of beauty. Have you noticed how things change? Have you noticed how that mankind is fickle? Have you noticed? And, and, and men, if your wife ever says, honey, do I look fat in this? Just plead the fifth. Don't say anything. It's just better to say, honey, you look fabulous. And you better say it like you mean it. Well, let me say this. You better mean it. You just better mean it, okay? So, so, so here's what you got to get a hold of. You, this morning, here's point number one of my message. You are a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. Turn to your neighbor and say, I told you so. Just keep reminding them of that. See, I'm a masterpiece. You're a masterpiece. Let me give you Paul. Paul says this, Ephesians 2, verse 10. It's our text. Uh, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When he created you, when he created me, he was making something of incredible value. Value, excuse me. And I want you to remember, God doesn't make junk. This marvelous scripture gives us a little bit, a little bit of a glimpse into the purpose for which we were created. It, here in Ephesians 2, the New King James translates this word as workmanship, but it comes from the Greek word poemia. And it's, very, it's the very word that we take our word poem. And so I want you to think about this, that, that God created you as a work of art. Uh, it means this. Here's what this Greek word means. It means that which is made, the thing made, or manufactured. And by implication, it literally means a work of art, a masterpiece, a creation made on purpose. Now, we have a hard time uh, getting our mind around this because we understand that, that girls get pregnant and babies are born. And Lord, how did you have a plan and all of that? But how many of you know that God is bigger than we are and that God's thoughts are not our thoughts? And we need to understand something. 
Paul adds another dimension, exciting dimension to this, and he says you're his workmanship, you're his masterpiece, you were created, and that word literally means recreated in Christ Jesus. We were created in the image of God, but we are recreated in the image of Christ. Think about this. You're a work of art, you're a masterpiece. You, when you were born again, were recreated in faith. You were created once, you were physically born, but when you came to Christ by the intention and sovereign mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, you were recreated. You were reborn. In other words, when we come to Christ, when a person truly comes to Christ, it's not the end, it's not an arrival, it's the very beginning. It's the very beginning. It's an entrance. And you're brand new, and I don't care if you're 40 years old, and this is where we get into trouble as human beings because we're successful, we're older, we're mature, we've got an education, we're pretty good at what we do, and then we get born again into the kingdom of God, and we're a brand new baby Christian. And we don't know anything about anything, about what God wants to do. But that's a great and exciting place to be because it's an entrance into a whole new life. Check this out. He who is eternal just made you immortal. What? Are you kidding? That's incredible. And so being truly saved is just the beginning of a great adventure in God, the beginning of a relationship that will last throughout eternity. Now, here's a practice that I do, and it's a good one, actually, so I want to encourage you to try it. I like to take scriptures and I like to paraphrase them so I can better understand them. Now, I'm not rewriting the Bible. I'm just paraphrasing, okay? So here's how I paraphrased this particular scripture. I am God's work of art. You know, that's pretty egotistical, pastor. No, I am, according to what Paul said. His masterpiece of recreation, formed by his powerful hand, being fashioned into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Every part of this process was ordained, purposed, and prepared in God's eternal plan for me that I might walk in his likeness before the world, not just doing good things, but being a good work in process. Not just doing, but being. Folks, when God said, I've created you, you are my workmanship, you're literally my poem, I am crafting you, writing you, I have a purpose and an eternal plan for you. And folks, it's a good plan. Turn to your neighbor and say that. You know what, it's a good plan. God's got a good plan for you. So no matter what happened on the ride to church this morning, you might be thinking, well, I got a plan for you. You know, oh, no, no, come on. You need to just say, Jesus, Jesus has a better plan, right? So here's my point number two. We were saved to serve. We were saved to serve. If you haven't been coming on Wednesday nights, let me encourage you to start coming back because we have some of our younger uh, preachers that are sharing. And boy, the other night, the guy that just introduced a sermon shared about serving. And I'll tell you what, it was powerful. He said in 2019, we, all, we ought to all make a commitment to serve more. I thought, man, that's right on the money. Here's what Paul uh, wrote to Timothy. God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given, which was given us in Christ Jesus before time began. Folks, we were saved not as a result of anything that we have done, not as a result of any good that was within us, but because God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. That God has a plan for you. And how many of you know, you didn't just get saved by your own volition, that he initiated that. That our God, for his own glory, reached down and drew you into his presence by the love of the Father and by the person of the Holy Spirit. Check this out. Redemption is all about his holy work performed in us. And we are all saved for the purpose of loving and serving and reflecting his image to the world. That's why he saved you. Because he wants to show himself glorious to the entire world. Look at this. In the kingdom of God, every life, every person has significance and purpose. Every one, they were created to function according to their specific and individual design. Isn't that amazing? 
That God, every time you run into a person, a different person, and you meet someone, and they look different, they act different, they're from a different heritage, and whenever we're tempted to compare or to judge, we need to stop the train and immediately recognize that that person is a unique individual created by Father God to be exactly who they are. And we need to begin to respect and admire them and recognize them for who they are. And I want you to get this. Remember this. Function determines form. Some people are just not formed like us, but they are created for function that God has an intention for every one of those people, every single life. Now, I want you to think about this. The scripture teaches us that Jesus gave his life to purchase our salvation, and he did that by the shedding of his own blood. Now, if that's true, who do we belong to? Anybody want to guess? If he, if he spilled his blood to purchase you, then who do you belong to? Texas. Right. How many of you know in Texas, trespassing is not looked on politely? Do you understand that you're liable to get shot? I tell people all the time, look, if you come to my door hungry, naked, or, or in need, I'll minister to you. If you break into my house, I will shoot you. If you scare me, I just might. And that's not because I don't love you. That's just because it's my house. And if you break in the door, you don't belong there. If you knock, I'll let you in. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. So check this out. Look what Jesus, look what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You were literally purchased with the very blood of Christ. Therefore, your body is not your own. I can do what I want, drink what I want, act like I want. No, you cannot. You don't belong to you anymore. You belong to Father. Purchased with the blood of the Son. And folks, but our service for God is not motivated out of guilt or fear or some sense of religious duty. It should flow forth out of an incredible sense of gratitude and love because Christ gave himself for us. Christ gave himself for us. Look at this. Paul said in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ compels us. Uh, the old King James says constrains us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Folks, we belong to him. We were purchased from death by his blood. He has given us the hope of a better future and we have been saved, but not just saved to indulge ourselves. We have been saved to serve, to serve God and to serve other people. That's what it's about. He, he saved us uh, so that we could participate with him in his eternal plan. Everybody still with me? I'm going to try to move through this quickly. We had such a long worship service. So I want to try to get done. Here it is. We we're called. Well, that's all right. The game doesn't start till two. We're good. We're good. We're good. Hey, I know something good's going to happen today because some people don't come usually till 1030. We're here at 10. It's amazing. Here we are called. I was not pointing fingers. You were. Now that is really not polite. That was not polite. <laughs> Sorry. She raised her hand. <laughs> well, confession's good for the soul, right? So, hey, if you're new here, we're a family. If you can't tell, we're going to have fun because Jesus is wonderful to have fun around. Okay, so check this out. We are called, we're not only were we saved to serve, but we're called to serve. You are called to serve. Now, I want to really take some time to unpack this because whenever we talk about called or calling, most people immediately think, well, you know, I mean, you know, missionaries and pastors and I don't know, maybe priests and nuns, they're called, right? But I mean, I'm just, I'm just a, a believer. But folks, the Bible speaks very differently. In fact, every one of us as a Christian has been called by God. 
Now, the word that Paul uses here is a Greek word, kletos, and it literally could be rendered like this. I love it. Urgently invited, summoned, and commissioned. When God called you, he summoned you, he urgently invited, he commissioned you. He commissioned you. But I love the word summon because look at this. Look what summon means. Denoting someone who ha- whose participation or presence has been officially requested for something especially a request to which refusal is not an option. What? When God calls you, when he summons you, it's an official request and refusal is just not an option. Paul says this, Romans 5, uh, Romans 1, I'm sorry, 5 through 7, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To whom, excuse me, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You have been called, you have been summoned by God. Peter said this, chapter two, verse nine. I love the scripture. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Wow, that's who we are. I love this morning's worship service because you know what, folks? You can praise your way to get, you can praise your way happy. You can praise your way to victory. If you're depressed, discouraged, despondent, and and just about to give up, lift your hands, start praising God with your mouth, make it loud, and your heart will follow your hands. You're the one that has the power to do that. Or you can just sit around and go, well, it's just not there. Nobody treats me right. And a blah, 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 blah. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep depression and gross dark misery. If it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. And if you're too old or too young to know what hee haw is, you ought to just watch it on YouTube. It's so dumb, it's funny. You're going to like it. But check it out. You have a choice. You can decide to live in victory today or walk out depressed. You can decide to be defeated by everybody else's negativity or you can get the victory. Here's something we're going to try here. I I spent some time with a pastor this past week and uh, and he said they did this deal at their church. He said they handed out these really big, thick rubber bands. They asked everybody to put it on their right wrists and they, they did seven days of no negativity. And they asked everybody in the church, whenever something negative comes out of your mouth, pop the rubber band. Go pop. And he said, look, I learned this the way they get kids that are cutters, that they have this desire for pain. So the way that they get them to stop cutting is they put these rubber bands on them. They say, every time you're tempted to hurt yourself, pop the rubber band. And and I said, well, how did it go? His name's Cord. He said, man, by the end of the week, I had a welt, brother. (laughs) He said, not by the end of the week, by the end of the first afternoon, I was like, whoa, I got to change the way I talk. Can I tell you something? If you will change the way you talk, it'll change the way you think. If you change the way you think, it'll change the way you live. And if you change the way you live, it'll change your future. You've got to decide. It's all up to you. I can't be the behavior police. I'm not going to follow you around. You've got to decide. I want to live in victory. I'm tired of living in defeat. Folks, when we, we who were called out of darkness into this light of salvation, we are also called into service. Look at this. Regardless of our job or career, we are called to be full-time Christians. But how can we be full-time Christians and a part-time servant? A non-serving Christian is a contradiction in terms. To be a true Christian means to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like. And so I want to read to you, how how did he example that for us? John chapter 13, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Every time I read that passage in John, Every time I think about that incredible moment when the Lord of all creation 
humbled himself and put on a towel and bowed before the feet of sinful man. And do you know he washed John and Matthew and Mark and Peter and he washed Judas's feet too. Do you understand that the God of all the universe humbled himself before sinful man and he served them? Paul told Timothy this, we are called, we are saved and called to be his own people, not because of our works, but because of his purpose. You were called because of his purpose. Peter adds, we're to show forth, to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness. Folks, our lives are to be lived in fulfillment of our calling, and that is serving God by serving others. Serving God by serving others. And I know I'm, I'm messing with a lot of people's concept because they absolutely think that life is all about them being served. But Jesus says something different. Can I tell you this? You're called of God. And look at this. Whenever we help someone in need, whenever you share a kind word of affirmation with one who's discouraged, whenever you minister in love and compassion to the brokenhearted, you're walking in the calling of God. When you begin to just reach beyond yourself, when you begin to minister in the grace and the mercy of God, you are walking in the calling of God. Now, sadly, the American church, for the most part, is hands off. You know what they say? Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's the responsibility of like the full-time clergy or maybe the Salvation Army, you know those guys. It's not really our responsibility. But can I tell you what, folks? We're called to serve. And it's a vital part of, uh, that's why it's so vital for us to be a part of the local church. Here you find the opportunity to begin to fulfill your calling in simple, practical ways. You begin to find opportunity. Now, I'm going to share with you my own heartfelt philosophy about this. Here it is, folks. Every one of us are of equal importance to God. Every one of us are of equal importance to God. Whether you are scrubbing a toilet, changing a diaper, preaching a sermon, opening the door as a greeter, every act of service is holy as unto the Lord. Whenever we start delineating and saying, no, that's higher and this is lower, that's wrong thinking. That's not the body of Christ. Remember, Jesus just washed the feet of the disciples. Every one of us is of equal importance. Here's the second thing. There are no insignificant people, gifts, or offerings in this church. There are no people that are insignificant or, 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 or gifts or offerings. Look, just because it does not attract the attention of others or gain public acknowledgement does not determine its importance or significance in the kingdom of God. Some of the greatest apostles, some of the greatest ministers of the kingdom are people that you'll never hear about till you meet them in heaven. They're never going to be on TBN or, or, or et cetera, et cetera. You're never going to see them on the front of charisma. You know why? Because they're hidden in the heart in the house of God and they're serving and they're giving. And then here's the last thing in my philosophy. There is a place for everyone to serve. You might be sitting here right now thinking, well, I just don't know how I fit in. I don't know where I fit in. Well, can I just say this to you? Be patient, get involved. Relationship releases ministry. Build relationships with people. And before you know it, you'll begin to find a place to volunteer. Or here's an idea. Pray about the dream God's put in your heart. Come and talk to us about it. It might be a brand new ministry that God wants wants to develop right here in our city. There are no insignificant people and there is a place for everyone to serve. Amen. Wow. Now, now our own physical body is the perfect example of this because how many of you right now have just been contemplating the sublime beauty of your liver? <laughs> well, that's weird. Your liver? Who even likes liver? How many of you guys like liver to eat calves liver? Let's pray for these people. Oh, Father. <laughs> Why would you want to eat another animal's filter? That's gross, I know. <laughs> but how many of you just, just a few moments ago just said, unless maybe you had to get up and leave the room, how many of you just said, man, I'm so thankful for my kidneys? And if they're not working, you're thankful that you can get them working. But I mean, think about that. Okay, so I'm trying to make a point here. We don't contemplate the loveliness of our internal organs, but we sure are thankful that they're working like they're supposed to. Am I right? We're thankful that they're working, they're hidden, they're unseen, but they are essential for your health and for your future. Okay, so what if your organ just said, well, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not serving here anymore. I'm doing my thing. What happens to your body? You're toast, right? You're toast. 
What if they said, no, no, I'm not going to leave, but I'm just going to take some time off, maybe a year or so. I'm just not going to serve. How many of you know you're toast? It's not going to work out for you. Thousands and thousands of local churches are dying from the inside out because of this. They've embraced a consumer-driven philosophy that says, all we're supposed to do is to serve you, serve you, serve you, serve you, serve you. And their people never get the victory and never begin to realize, well, I'm not here to be served. I'm here to serve. I was called not to be served. I was called to serve. Folks, listen. I've even heard people say, well, you know what? I know, man, you just get staff to do that. Just pay people to do that. Can I tell you what, folks? We don't have enough money here to pay everybody to do everything. And if that's your mindset, give more. <laughs> if you think I ought to be paying for it to get done, well, then you got to up the ante, folks. Come on. Let's put some skin in the game here. Folks, if you search the scriptures and if you're really honest, you're going to discover that the children of Israel never came before God with empty hands. They always brought an offering. They always came to the worship of the Lord with an offering. And look at this. New Testament tells us Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. But check this out, folks. Once they were found, he sends them forth to minister by touching others. Once they're found, he doesn't just go, glad to have y'all here. I'll just keep serving you. You know what this guy told me this week? He said, man, you know, pastoring's a dangerous job. He said, I said, really? He said, yeah, Jesus only did it for three and a half years. It'll kill you. <laughs> Uh, I said, you know, I think you're right. Sometimes I feel like you're right. Folks, check it out. What does he do? He gifts them. He blessed them. And he sends them. He sends them to do what? To serve. Every one of us here is called into the game. There's no bench sitters here. Every one of you has to get involved, needs to get involved, or you're never going to grow and mature in the things of God. If all you do is sit and soak, you will sour. If all you do is just sit and take it in and think it's all about you, then you're never going to mature in your walk with God until you begin to see beyond your own need and start ministering to others. And look, folks, you don't have to know the Bible front to back. You just have to take what you've already learned and step out in Jesus' name. Everybody with me? Here's number four. I'm trying to hurry up here. We're not only are we saved to serve, called to serve, but we were commanded to serve commanded to serve. Now, I love the new body of Christ. A lot of new people in church today, when you use a word like commanded, immediately they feel violated, offended. Oh my gosh. But how many of you know God commands his children? Abraham was chosen by God because he commanded his household. The kids listened to him when he talked. Here's what Matthew tells us, chapter 20. And whosoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Boy, that flies in the face of most people that want to go into the ministry as a vocation, doesn't it? Well, I thought they were going to serve me. I was going to get an airplane and a big, big new car and all that stuff. Well, that's just not the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. So Jesus was very direct when he said these words. And here's what I want you to get. He said to us that serving is not optional, Serving is not something that we fit in if it happens to be convenient when we have a little spare time. Jesus, the Bible says, came to serve and to give, and he expects no less from those who follow him. Those two verbs should characterize and define our lives, serving and giving, serving and giving. Folks, look at this. I love this because I like to read theology. Sound theology and scriptural literacy are not an end in and of themselves. They should always lead to humility and service. That good theology is very important and, and you should know the Bible. But folks, it should always lead to humility and to service. Check this out. Knowledge that doesn't lead to service ends in stagnation. If you just have all this biblical information, but you're not serving with it, then you're going to stagnate. You're like the Dead Sea. Everything flows in, nothing flows out. And I love this too. Information without implementation leads to fermentation. If all you ever do is give me more truth, more truth, I want to know more truth, I want to learn, I want to learn, I want to learn, but you never implement that truth in your life, if you don't ever really start to serve and to give, then you're going to ferment. You're not going to grow. You're going to die. 
Now, most believers already know far more than they put into practice. <laughs> Ouch. I like to use my, my father-in-law as an example. He had a music store and he had banjos for sale. And he's a piano and organ guy. And this young man came in and said, hey, you have a banjo. Yeah, I want to buy a banjo. Okay, great. I'll sell you a banjo. And he said, do you teach banjo lessons? And my father-in-law said, no, no, we don't. So the guy said, oh, okay. And he left. Didn't buy the banjo. That happened to him a couple of times. The next time a kid came in and said, oh, you got a banjo. Do you teach banjo lessons? And my father-in-law Morris said, yes, sir, we sure do. <laughs> and he said, really? He said, yeah, you buy the banjo. Come back in two weeks. I'll have your first lesson. The guy bought the banjo, went out the door. He sold him a Mel Bay book. My father-in-law went over to the rack and got his own copy of the Mel Bay book and another banjo. And he stayed one week ahead of that kid. He said, I learned the banjo. He came in. I taught him what I learned last week. You don't have to be an expert. You just have to be one week ahead. Think about it. We, we, we say, oh, no, I can't do that. I can't help those people. I can't say anything about the Bible. I beg your pardon. You already know more than you practice. Start practicing what you know. When you give yourself to serve others, what's going to happen is your faith is going to grow, your humility is going to grow, and the grace of God's Spirit is going to become profound and manifest in your life. It's through serving, it's through giving, it's through loving. Now, you know, you know, serving is not our natural inclination. In fact, it's just the opposite. Most of us are expecting to be served instead of looking for someone to serve. So over and over and over again, we hear discontented church people who complain about not being fed, not having their needs met. Usually, parentheses, that just means I'm not getting my way. But can I tell you something? If you're over 20 years old and you're not feeding yourself, we have a problem. I love my son and daughter, but if they said, Daddy, we're not eating anymore until you feed us, I would say, well, your remaining days are going to be short. <laughs> because if you're not old enough to feed yourself, come on with it. Can I tell you something, folks? God wants you to be a self-feeder. Why? So you can help others. He wants you to feed. That, the, as long as people are looking to the church to provide all the perks of convenience and comfort without the demands of commitment and sacrifice, those people will never mature into the people God wants to use. And if you're praying, why isn't God using me? I want to be used. Let me tell you, commitment and sacrifice, giving and service. The true sign of a mature believer is the one who no longer says, who's going to meet my needs and starts saying, where can I help? Can I help meet your need? Where can I serve? What can I do for my Jesus? That's the sign of maturity, folks. Spiritually mature people never look for a place to be served. They look for a place to grab hold of the plow and serve. They want to serve. And you know, let me tell you something else about spiritually mature people. Here you go. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Can I tell you, when you really grow up in God... Even when people in church act like they shouldn't act, you don't get offended and leave. You don't do this or that. You know what you do? You grow. You go, wow, I'm not going to be offended. Great peace have they that love their law. Now, I want to I make a disclaimer here, okay? Can I do this? Everybody still with me? I'm almost done serving. But I want to make a disclaimer here. There, there are people who serve out of wrong motives and the misguided belief that serving equates to being accepted in the eyes of God. That's called works, the doctrine of works. It doesn't. We love because we were first love. Huh. We serve not to gain acceptance or approval. We serve because we have been accepted in the beloved and we want others to be there with us. That's why we serve. I don't serve to get any acclamation from you or affirmation. I serve because I've been served by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I love because I've been loved by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Folks, that's why we do this. Look, we're all going to have to give our lives for something. Now I'm closing, so don't shut me off. Pay attention. So you're all, you're all going to give your lives to something. Maybe it's going to be your hobby. Maybe it's going to be your sports. Maybe it's your fame or your wealth. Maybe it's your entertainment or your pleasure. But at the end of your life, when you stand before God, you and I are going to give an account to what God has given to us. 
And at that moment, all of our excuses and all of our rationalizations and justification for our selfish lifestyles, our wasted time and gifts are going to be so hollow and so empty. Can you imagine standing before the throne of God and saying, well, well Lord, Lord, I, I know I should have served, but, but I mean, I was really busy. I had my career. I mean, Lord, I had my reputation. I mean, think about it, Lord, you know. Or how about this one? Hey, God, I mean, I know I, I, I was supposed to serve, but I mean, my time was really important to me. I mean, I spent hours working on my Fortnite skills. You know, I'm a gamer. I mean, you know, God, you know, my social media presence, I get like a million billion likes. I mean, everybody loves me on Facebook, what's up and what's up and who the heck knows what else they're on. I don't even know. I'm off. So, 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 but well, think about it. Lord, you know, man, I would have served you, but wow, you know, I had to binge on Netflix. I mean, I had to catch up on like 18 seasons on 48 shows. And I spent hours in front of the TV binging. What are we going to say when we stand before the Lord and he goes, man, I gave you all of this. What'd you do with it? Well, Lord, You know, this is so, such an important truth that, that it was repeated in the gospel six different times. Here's what Jesus said. Whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. What does that mean? It's not talking about killing yourself. That's not at all what it's talking about. It's talking about giving yourself to something that really matters. Do I think you should have a career? Yes. Do I think you should get an education? Yes. Do I think you should go to college if you're a young person? If you can absolutely afford it and you're passionate for it? Yes. Yes. You know why? God needs godly nurses. God needs godly lawyers. That's almost, a, it's almost an oxymoron. But, but uh, God needs godly people. Am I, am I right? In every field of service. And you are where you are, working where you are, because God's called you to be there to be the light and the truth. God's called you to be there. And let me tell you something. I'm going to just share it as, as, as discreetly as I can. But even when you're told you can't talk about Jesus, you can bring Jesus. And when you bring Jesus, you know what will happen? They'll start asking you, what's different about you? When you go with the right motive, they'll start saying, what is it about you? And you can say, well, you know, I'm not supposed to talk religion, but if you just want to hear about my testimony, I can tell you that. And let me tell you, folks, we'll get saved because they'll see something in you. Look at this. Jesus says it again. Let me, let me read this and I'll try to move to do an end. Do you know what I've done to you? Jesus is asking. You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you call pastor and ask him to go pray for those others. Amen. Blessed are you if you give their name to the Salvation Army for their help. Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if what? You do them. Yeah. Blessed are you if you do them. Folks, a life lived solely for the indulgence and fulfillment of ourselves is a meager, meager existence. Serving God by serving others is the truest path, the truest path to significance and meaning. It's in serving others and serving others alone that you're going to find life's true fulfillment in the presence of God. Why do we serve them? So we get accolades, so we'll win a, a, a prize and everybody will say what a great compassionate guy or girl you are. No, it's for the glory of God. When we serve them out of the love of God that man, I'm a beggar, I was begging for bread and he fed me and I want you to come and be fed too. I was on the out and now I'm on the in and you can be in there too because he died for you. But the question is, are we just going to be totally consumed with ourselves or are we going to just go, wow, wait a minute, I was saved, I was created for a purpose, that my life has meaning, that my life has significance, that I am important. I haven't had a guy tell me, wait a minute, come on, Mike, I'm, I'm just a diesel mechanic. I mean, I mean, what the heck is that? How important is that? I said, it's real important if you're the truck driver with a broke truck. 
What are you talking about? Of course it's important. Whenever we try to demean ourselves, listen, stop it, folks. Get that rubber band and pop it. <laughs> stop it. And you need to understand you were created, designed by God exactly as you are because you're going to reach people that will never talk to me. You're going to reach people that will never come to this church. You are going to spread out into this county and we're going to make a difference for the glory and the honor of Jesus. That's the point. That's the point that we're called and we're saved so that we can go out and serve and give and see others come. In Jesus' name, would you stand to your feet with me? Now, I started this morning with reading from Jeremiah. And the reason that I did is I used to be incredibly troubled by that scripture because Jeremiah says, I go to the potter's house and the potter's making a pot on the wheel. And I don't know if you, anybody know anything about pottery. Yep. My, my brother-in-law was an amazing potter, really a, an amazing artist. But man, his room where his wheel was, where he spun pots, it was a disaster. I mean, it was a mess. It's a mess. When you start working with pottery, it's a mess. But I was reading that. Jeremiah, Jeremiah says that the hands of the potter, he's forming this, this vessel and then he says this, but the vessel was marred in the hands of the potter. And I said, wait a minute, God, you're the potter. You don't make junk. You don't make junk. How could the vessel be marred in the hands of God? And it's, it was almost a duh moment for me. You know, I kind of went, oh, duh. You know, you don't go to Hobby Lobby back in Jerusalem and buy clay. Now when you're a potter, you go buy clay and it's been cleaned and it's been purified and, it, and you know, it's not filled with impurities. Back then they went to the riverbank and they dug it out with a shovel. So when the potter's working the clay and molding the clay and he's forming this beautiful vessel, all of a sudden there's a rock or a stick in there and all of a sudden the vessel is marred. So in the great love of God, you know what he does? He reaches down and he picks that out and he starts all over again and you're recreated in the hands of the potter. You were created for a purpose. You were designed by an omnipotent, omnipotent master of the universe. And then you were born again, recreated by the love of God and by the grace of Christ so that you could be a vessel filled with his life. You know why? People need hope. People in this world are dying for the lack of hope. People need freedom, they need deliverance. They need to know that something greater than them is worth living for. And so I want you just to lift your hands with me. I want you just to turn your face to the Lord. And Father, I just pray that something I've said today has made an impact. That Lord, these men and women are precious in your sight. They are not a mistake, no matter what their mama said, no matter what their friends say. No matter what, they're, no matter what the, the world has thrown on them or put on them, that they were created. They have been through the very struggles, the very fire, of the furnace of their lives because you were forming them and shaping them to be exactly who you created them to be. And the Lord, in this moment, as we stand in your presence, Father, we want to offer our lives as a living sacrifice to you. Lord, we want to offer ourselves to you. And Lord, we want to submit our hearts to the hand of the potter. And we say to you today, oh God, purge us and clean us. God, take everything that's wicked from me and, and Lord, shape me into the vessel you've created me and designed me to be. And oh Lord, don't stop till you're done. Don't stop till you're done. And Lord, let the holy fire of your love purify me that I might be a vessel used by you. Oh God, do something in me. Do something new in me today. If that's your prayer, just lift your hands and say, Lord, let it begin. Lord, just do something in me today. Do something.